In this chapter, we're going to talk about port scanning, types of port scans, port scanning tools, uh, pane sweeps, uh, and how shell scripting, you can use it to automate some security tasks. So what's the purpose of port scanning? Well, in port scanning, you want to find what services are offered by a host. So if you found a number of servers and computers through your footprinting process, now you want to figure out what services are offered by the host in order to determine what potential vulnerabilities are on those servers that you can exploit. Open services, such as Telnet, HTTP, FTP, these services can be exploited. Um, vulnerabilities on those services can be exploited in order to launch an attack. And uh, oftentimes in testing, we wanna scan all ports, not just all well-known ports. Oftentimes you'll see IoT devices that are outside of the well-known ports. And oftentimes those are the most vulnerable and have the most available exploits. If the intention is to get on a network, you really just need a single entry point and you can investigate all possible entry points in order to do so. Here's an example of Angry IP Port Scanner. It's a piece of software you can use to uh, scan various interfaces. Port scanning programs allow you to get a number of pieces of data. For instance, which ports are open. So again, we talk about what ports are available, what services are running, what could be vulnerable to attack. Closed ports are important as well. You want to know what are, what's being actively blocked, what's specifically turned off, what have administrators already taken into an account on their network, uh, in securing it or blocking certain features. And also filtered ports. So filtered ports tells you a firewall is being used or some sort of traffic manager. Um, and it gives you an indication of the protection level of that organization or things you should avoid if you're trying to exploit vulnerabilities on systems against that organization. So types of uh, port scans, again, oftentimes these scans are being used using TCP IP. So we have an address or port, we're looking for sockets. So a, uh, a SYN scan, um, if you remember SYN is the synchronization flag, it's the first step of a three-way TCP IP handshake between two hosts. Um, and this is, uh, you know, it's a stealthy scan. Uh, I don't, again, don't really agree with that. It's probably being logged on, on any properly secured network. Uh, but basically, you're just setting the first part of a three-way handshake. Now, you have to be careful because this can lead to what are called SYN floods. Uh, misconfigured systems, older systems... If you send too many synchronization packets, you can crash those hosts if their memory and allocation is not properly managed or if it leaves so, uh, you know, these potentially so, new sockets open. The connect scan is the full three-way handshake. So SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK. So you send a sender sends a synchronization flag to the receiver. The receiver responds with synchronization and acknowledge, and the sender responds with acknowledge. So that does a full TCP three-way handshake. <clears throat> a null scan is where all packet flags are turned off. So synchronization, acknowledge, finished, urgent, push, reset, ECE, congestion window, and the nonce sum. These are all turned off in a null scan in order to see what response the server will get. And the, uh, the uh, it says here, Xmas scan. This is called the Christmas tree scan. Um, why is it called the Christmas tree scan? Well, um, it makes your switch and computers light up like a Christmas tree. 
Um, if you send the finished, the push, and the urgent flags, uh, oftentimes this causes some serious problems. Um, and you're just kind of going after everything and um, tends to cause a lot of traffic around the network and a lot of responses from hosts. So that is your uh, Christmas tree scan. Uh, act scan, that's where you just skip, um, you skip the three-way handshake and go to step three and just send a acknowledge flag. And a lot of times firewalls will let this traffic through because it thinks, oh, we've already approved, uh, the first two steps and haven't dropped those. So we can let the third step get through. Um, they finished scan, you're sending TCP packets marked as finished. And oftentimes if a port is closed, it'll respond with a reset packet. And then UDP scans, uh, this takes advantage of the internet control message protocol port unreachable, unreachable message type. Um, so again, you could see using UDP, which potential ports are open. There's lots of port scanning tools available, um, and I agree, not are all accurate, so you want to um, test them out. Uh, professionally, Nessus, uh, so Tenable IO, uh, and their suite of tools um, are the best. OpenVAS uh, is another option that is free if you want something. To throw on a laptop and use Nmap, obviously one of the most well known. Um, so again, this was originally written for Frack Magazine. Uh, it is one of the most popular open source port scanning tools. Nessus, I would argue, is professionally the most popular and one of the more expensive. Um, there is a GUI front end, uh, Zenmap which makes things a bit easier, but again, you should be learning the command line where possible. Here's an example of running Nmap and the various flags that are enabled, the help section. You can run the help screen on your own. Um, OpenVAS, uh, also Greenbone Security Assistant. If you go to their website, um, it's going to show up as Greenbone, um, but uh, OpenVAS is kind of the uh, well-known name of it. Again, like I said, Nessus is, is uh, the most popular. It's no longer on GPL, uh, but Tenable owns it, and it's very much non-commercial. Uh, are very much commercial. They offer a non-commercial version. I believe it's like 16 hosts you can scan. So if you want to try it out, you can download it. But it's extremely limited. Um, OpenVAS, so when Tenable took Nessus commercial, uh, OpenVAS is a fork and split off from Nessus back in 2005. Um it's something, if you want to use something complex, uh, OpenVAS is the way to go without paying for it. And here's some screenshots of uh, what it looks like when you find some vulnerabilities. Ping sweeps are uh, another option you can use. Um, you essentially can you know, try and ping many hosts, and you can use that to identify which IP addresses belong to what hosts, and if they're active. Um, uh, problems with this is if machines are off, computers are shut down, virtual machines are turned off, they won't be responding, so thus it'll say they don't exist when they do. Uh, a lot of networks block ICMP, echo, requests, and replies, uh, as well as most other ICMP traffic. Firewalls typically block those requests from outside of the network. So oftentimes, uh, ping sweeps can be absolutely unreliable. Um, F-ping, you can um, 
ping multiple IP addresses simultaneously. It's on Kali. You can give it a range uh, and or even an input file uh, so you can run a ping sweep using fping. And here is an example of various parameters that you can run on fping. So uh, fping-g uh, will let you specify a beginning and ending IP address uh, if you want to do a full ping sweep. And here's an example of fping running using a range using the dash g switch. hping uh, performs ping sweeps and uh, you can inject modify IP packets to bypass some filtering devices. Um, you really should be familiar with this tool and its various parameters. Here's an example of the help page for HPing. Page two of it. And page three. So when you're crafting IP packets, um, if you can you know, remember um, or look back on some of the content from TCP IP uh, courses that you've taken, remember the packet components. There's a source IP address, destination IP address, and uh, various flags. And when you craft your own IP packets, it can help you obtain some customized information about a service and you can use HPing or FPing to send your packets. It's extremely important that you have a very strong understanding of scripting and programming languages, not only to make your life easier, but to be able to automate tasks that are extremely repetitive and get some of these tasks done in reasonable amounts of time. So it says here, the advantage, automates tasks, time saving, requires basic programming skills. Absolutely. And again, if you haven't gone through programming courses, I truly believe you need to. Um, whether it be on your own or, or through your degree program, having a strong understanding of programming languages, scripting languages, and how those scripting languages integrate with either the operating system or other tools or your shell is going to be key to doing your job in the cybersecurity space. So um, I, I guess we're talking about shell scripting here, similar to DOS batch files, yep. A script or a batch file is a bunch of commands. Um, they they uh, they flow in order or in loops. Again, depend depending on what your control blocks are, your control flow, um, and again, it's to take potentially repetitive commands and uh, automate that repetition. Um, yes, as with anything, practice is the key. But you should, you really need to be strong in scripting, strong in programming um, to not only make your life easier, but to increase the chances of success in your chosen area of study in cybersecurity. Um, yeah, so... The, the book is showing you some scripting in Vim. Oh, calling it scripting is a stretch. Um, Vim is a text-based editor and accepts commands. These are Vim commands. Um, that's great. You need to be learning, if I can give some recommendations kind of off the script here, you need to be learning um, bash scripting, um, uh, other shell scripting in Linux, you can choose your flavor, um, but having that, that a strong understanding of Linux shell scripting and also Windows PowerShell um, on the Windows side, extremely powerful, extremely exploitable. Python is an excellent choice for building tools. Uh, in the um, uh, scripting for cybersecurity course that I teach, um, the course project is to build a cybersecurity tool in Python 
the last couple of weeks of the course. And it's extremely important not to just use other people's tools, but as you develop your own way of doing things, your own methodologies, your own secret sauce, why not write a tool to automate some of that? Uh, it's, it not only saves you time, uh, but gives you a way to make your your secret sauce, make your steps, your in your mental algorithm that you use uh, to find um, vulnerabilities, to create exploits even faster. If you can task a machine to do it, why not? So this slide is is kind of a bunch of junk. Um, I don't really like it, but again, focus on shell scripting, PowerShell, Python. These are really powerful languages that are at your disposable, disposal and pretty easy to learn. Okay, this one makes sense. Here's a shell script um, that uh, essentially performs a loop function. So this is closer to... What you would write. So, uh, you know, we talked about last week. Um, well, these are last week's summary. Okay. Summary for this week. What are we talking about? We talked about port scanning, the various methods you could use uh, in port scanning, why port scanning is important. Uh, we talked about Nessus and nmap and openvas zenmap is the gui for nmap but again you should be familiar with uh, the command line switches um, if you want to try a fully featured commercial quality port scanner at home openvas is the way to go um, we talked about fping and hping and we talked about the importance of scripting so uh, again, um, if you have any questions this week on any of the content, um, let me know. Um, if I could give you one kind of life takeaway for this week is if you're not a strong programmer, work to become one. Uh, it's going to help you. It's going to help you in your cybersecurity career. It's going to help you, especially with some of your ethical hacking projects. The ability to script and automate not only saves time, but allows you to focus on more important aspects of your job, interpreting results, giving proper feedback to clients, performing remediations, et cetera, et cetera.